welcome back to the show, everybody. We are back in the <laughs> studio with a super special guest. We have Mr. Stephen Weda joining us. And Stephen Weda is the third and final photographer for us that it was very essential that we got his interview on the show for multiple reasons. Um, Stephen Weda is the most published photographer in Playboy's history. Um, he shot the most celebrity pictorials, most covers, with the likes of Carmen Electra, Kim Kardashian, Jenna Jameson, Barbie Twins. He's worked with a plethora of celebrities, Denzel Washington, Travis Barker comes to mind, and the list goes on. Um, and we'll get into that. Stephen can tell us more about um, particular people that he worked with or favorite memories. And I know that there's some funny stories that go along with being um, on a shoot and uh, hiccups that may have arrived um also best known for his affiliation with pamela anderson all of the um publications that pamela was featured in were shot by steven and they had a very close working relationship and the best of the best was always conceived together between um steven and pamela and it shows in the pictures um Real quickly, I want to read a letter that Hugh Hefner had written. It was an homage, really, to Stephen. And so I'm going to read it. And it was a, um, you know, it speaks volumes in terms of what it says and about uh, mm -hmm. Stephen's character and his work. Um, so from, from Hugh Hefner, for over 30 years, Stephen Weta has shared my dream and vision. From an inauspicious startup Playboy, he has become the most published photographer in the history of Playboy. And that's a huge accolade. His photographs have, have helped Playboy in changing the way the world looks at women and changed the way women look at the world. His influence on photography cannot be overstated. His evolving styles, his sense of sexuality, coupled with the personality of his photographic subjects, brought the Playboy dream from the fantasy of decadence and passion in Paris to the charm of the girl next door in the wheat fields of Texas all to life. In his heart, he is a cowboy whose job has brought him into contact with the world's most beautiful women. Playboy is read for its photographs, and what the reader saw in his photographs for Playboy was the American dream made real. So we're going to start there. All right. Well, thank you very so, much. You're, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're, being very you're being very gracious. Thank you. Well, it's it's important, and our audience loves to hear, you know, all the all the back history and, and put it all into context. And I'm telling you, every time we do an interview, we just like pull out this golden nugget of history that we didn't know about, and it just adds a lot of context to the show. So we're gonna start with your venture into Playboy and how you even ended up there. So, Stephen, you were at Playboy from 1983 to 2013, correct? That's correct. Yes. That's the okay. three years that have references. Okay. And tell us about, I know that you were plucked from obscurity and you shared that story with me, but <laughs> share with share with the audience because it's really interesting. <laughs> well, um, I, I never planned to be a photographer. Um, and it happened very serendip serendipitously. Um, out of college, I became a newspaper reporter. And okay. from there, I started doing pictures to go with my stories. Uh, I uh, created a, a process where you could get photographs to reproduce in letterpress. Now, you're all too young to know what letterpress is, but it was <laughs> just something that was gray. There was no whites, there was no darks or blacks. There was just gray, gray type, gray paper, gray everything. So I, um, created a process where a coat like this, you could see the lapels. And from there, um, I started to do fashion work for a local department store. Okay. Um, and then um, I lost that job. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so I, I met uh, Dwight Hooker, who was a Playboy photographer that was retiring. He had come to Utah to be a uh, to go to architectural school, so he mm -hmm. was now doing um, building houses in Robert Redford's uh, Sundance Ski Resort, and he wanted to keep his connection with Playboy. So he was doing what sort of man reads Playboy, which is a service ad where our our hero is 
good looking and gracious and he's doing all these adventurous things while his girl is with him. Okay. And so that's where it gets to what's the man reads Playboy. Right. So I start showing him pictures and he uh he wasn't very encouraging. Um <laughs> At one, at one point, he's looking at the pictures and he's going, well, good thing you have a, a, a day job because you're never going to be a Playboy photographer. So oh, my gosh. I, <laughs> what a I, statement. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It, you know, it, I've been told that more than once. So, uh, so I um, kept sending pictures in to Playboy. I get rejected, I get accepted, I get another job, da 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 da, go back and forth. Uh, then Marilyn had me come down uh, and I interviewed with her. I uh, went back to Chicago because she was in a competition with Chicago. Hef told Chicago and Marilyn to find yeah. the next centerfold photographer. And okay. so. And Chicago didn't want to lose this because they had a very tough relationship with Marilyn because she had access to half and she could do anything she wanted. Yes, and I know that. And let me actually um, tell the audience as well, because this was really interesting background that you told me that Marilyn Grabowski was originally in the Chicago offices working as a secretary, right? She was, yes. And Chicago was, said, hey, do you guys want to go or anybody want to go to L.A. to open up a studio? And she did, you know, and uh, Mario Casilli was the only photographer there. And from that, you know, she was essentially in a no, you know, um, a job was it was a no end job. Yeah, um, dead end. Yeah. I was I was a, I was another one that wasn't um, expected to do anything out of you know out of high school. They said I'd be good at McDonald's. So 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 I you know both of us were kind of rejects trying to find our way, and and right. Marilyn became one of the most uh, important editors in magazine publishing. She was there with. Uh, Anna Whitnar of mm -hmm. Vogue and Jules Campbell of uh, Sports, Sports Illustrated. Illustrated. Yeah. yeah. So you get this competition going, okay? They had a meeting in the mansion, and Marilyn says, I want you guys to go on the competition. And so she had a lot of other people to choose from, but for whatever reason, she chose me because I didn't know much of anything. Um, and Chicago chose David Meese. So they flew me oh, back to. Oh, okay. Yeah, they flew me back to Chicago to interview with everybody back there, and um, uh, <laughs> I walked through the studio and I looked at all this equipment. I said, "I don't know how to use any of this. I don't know what I'm going to do." <laughs> so you know, uh, it was it was just yeah. You know, you're going to go, it's, it's like I did on a lot of things. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'll figure uh, something out. Figure so, it out. <laughs> yeah. So I gave, I gave Marilyn two women from uh, Utah that she accepted and she wanted as playmates. And she said she would let me photograph one and at the same time let me uh, watch uh uh, Ken Marcus, how he did his center. Okay. Fights. Okay. And I don't know if she was serious in it or she was just trying to get the girls. I think she, I, Dwight had told me that she wasn't ever going to accept me. You know, I'm a, you know, I, I don't have the, I never went to photo school. I never went to art school. All the other right. guys did that. So he told me she would never accept me. What do you think? Right. And also tell us the story about Jeff Cohen, because I thought that was fascinating when you shared with me. So Jeff <laughs> Cohen was a editor and photographer out of um, Chicago. I worked a ton with him and all the newsstand specials, but share with the audience what he told you as well. So the second person to tell you, you're not going to be. <laughs> well, it, it, a Marilyn wanted Chicago to give me an assignment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, I was, looking to uh, make the cut. And so Chicago, Maryland sent me to uh, Alaska for Girls of Alaska. And I went, took a lot of pictures, went a lot of places. 
And when I got back, sent the, the film to uh, Chicago, wasn't anything on the film. The shutter mm -hmm. on, the, on, the, on the lens had come apart. It was a Nikon lens. So everything oh my God. And back and back then it wasn't doing Polaroids uh, because I didn't know anything about a Polaroid back or taking Polaroids to set up with. So um, went to Jeff because he did the girls of, and he looked at the pictures and said, you know, they're a disaster. You don't have anything here. I'm going to send David Meesey and I'm not going to send him to uh, Alaska. I'm going to send him someplace else, give him a chance. So uh, in our conversation, he said to me, it's unfortunate you don't have the talent to match your opportunities. Wow. Wow. So, <laughs> That's <laughs> wild. <laughs> yeah. So, I, you know, Jeff won, you know, he was Maryland's rival. Okay. And they fought, they fought tooth and nails. And Maryland wasn't going to let Chicago win when so right. yeah so after um you know i watched ken marcus we then took my other girl other woman from uh, uh from utah and we mm -hmm. did a centerfold on her and we did it on location in utah and centerfolds are not good on location because there's a thing called the sun and it moves so your yeah. light changes constantly yeah that's right. what you have to do in a studio. I mean, center folds would take five to 10 days and mm -hmm. they're a process of building. I sent you a, a, the Polaroids that, that I have. Mm -hmm. And I'm the only one that has those Polaroids. I'm the only one that has the diagrams. And um, it was Jamie but, Bergman and the Polaroids, my bestie. I love Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, there's, there's multiples, uh, but yeah, that's yeah, what I saw. I've got a lot, but then now the original eight by tens Polaroids that look just like they did when I took them forty years ago. I don't know how they've survived, but I, I keep them. Isn't all that up. wild? Yeah. Yeah. So um, they, I did this my centerfold. We did it in location. Marilyn didn't like it because it was a little problematical. So we did it again in the studio. That was Susie Scott. So oh, okay. I sent, she, Marilyn sent Susie Scott and Jeff sent Susie Schott, I think her name was, dark haired woman. Um, that was David's last centerfold. Um, he went on to oh, work. Oh, yeah. He went on to work the girls of and was Jeff's boy. And I became Mo's boy. And okay. It was good because, okay. Because because she protected me. She had a vested interest in me because I was her choice, and she could not lose to mm -hmm. Chicago. Mm -hmm. so. And so, what year was that that you guys uh, went off to LA to start the studio? Well, she had already had the studio going oh, with Mark okay. Casili, and she had built up a relationship with Hef because okay. he moved from Chicago out to Hobney Hills. So she mm -hmm. had direct ac access with him, which mm -hmm. gave her a lot of power over Chicago. You know, the story of Anna Nicole Smith was that Chicago had never really seen her, and they absolutely said no to her being Playmate of the Year. But And why? No, because she was big and curvy and bad boob job, and, and she, you didn't know how and, the hell you were going to shoot her, and da-da-da-da-da. <laughs> well, because... She was, in, in Gary Cole's world, words, she wasn't the type of woman they wanted as Playboy uh, uh, of the Year because oh, she was okay. a stripper. She was a stripper. Oh, she right, was, right. She was running around with a 90-year-old millionaire. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, you know, it wasn't the best backstory. So, but Marilyn changed it changed her name from her she came to us as uh vicky smith right and so and chicago the only thing they saw were the pictures that i that Marilyn sent that i had taken they never met her before she was named playmate of the year they were oh wow they got it shoved, they got it shoved down their throats by <laughs> Marilyn going going to to have 
to Hef, so, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then Hef obviously so, fell in love with the whole pictorial. I mean, she, I mean, she was incredible in front of the camera. What a beautiful woman. And then that's what I found that I had to do with her because if you look at the pictures I did of her, there's not a lot of nudity in them. You'd see mm -hmm. glimpses of nudity here, glimpses of nudity there. What I worked with was her face and a magnificent face and her mm -hmm. attitude. And I mm -hmm. just let her roll, okay? I just let her go. And she gave you su sexy pictures that you believe she was talking to you and not mm -hmm. to the camera. And yeah, so she really knew how to added. work that camera. Yep. But, and that was from her days being a stripper. Mm hmm. So. That's okay, why so it, it, that's, it added some benefit to her becoming Playmate of the Year for being a stripper. Well, Who would have known? <laughs> yeah, well, that's why Gary didn't want her. So between right. that and, and Marshall, her boyfriend. Right, so, right, and right, was, right. And she, was married, and she was married at the time with a child while she was having the affair with Marshall. Oh, that's so right. She, that's she right. was not the image of what you normally think of for Playmate of the Year. But sure. her pictures for guests were spectacular. And she became, on top of that, um, Claudia Schiffer, who I also photographed, was Marciano's girlfriend at the time. Oh, and I didn't know she, that they were dating. Yeah, I never knew that. Yeah, because yeah, she was the face of guests. Right, she had a very right. famous picture of oh, her yeah. from the side for guests. Um, but then when Anna came, <laughs> Claudia, he said goodbye to Claudia and made Anna the girlfriend. Interesting. Yeah. I love it. Spill the so, tea. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that went for a while until the next girl came along. And, you know, Anna was difficult. She drank a lot. Um, she... She had a, a mood swings, you know, when I, I would vote, were photographing her, she'd go in the studio, I mean, in the makeup, she'd just sit there. Nothing would come out of her, nothing. Hmm. And mm -hmm. then, you know, you'd take her out on set and still there was no communication or anything. And then you pick up the camera and it's boom, she's on. So, and she goes just, you know, you let her run. I, I move her this yeah. way, I move her that way. I show a little breast, you know, I show a little butt, you know, I show a little leg. But if you look at her shooting, she doesn't have a lot of nudity because she was not like you or Karina or anybody mm -hmm. else. She did not have a playboy body. She was a plus size girl. And, that, and that's one of the things I get irritated about because fashion magazines are now saying, we're doing plus size. We're, <laughs> we're, doing, a, we're, we're doing a black girl. We did Anna yeah. Nicole Smith as a yeah. plus, as a plus, you know, forty years ago, and and the and the first black girl that appeared in um, Playboy was about five or ten years before. It was in the early um, in the seventies somewhere, and the and the fashion fashion magazines make a big deal out of, of what they're doing, but they've been behind Playboy. Playboy yeah. was leading. I mean. Playboy was not part of the elites on the coast, okay? Los Angeles, New York, and that. Mm -hmm. But it dealt with the, the rest of America, okay? It talked, like Hef says, it's the girl next door. It's the girl that you might meet that you hope that if you have the chance, you could possibly date, okay? Right. She's not a supermodel, you know? She's not... Uh, uh, you know, a celebrity in any sense, you know, we eventually worked our ways into celebrities. Mm -hmm. But at that time, it was all about you know, this girl next door that, you know, could be somebody yeah. you would know. You know. Isn't that the truth? You know, um, after, I think it was at Anna Nicole's Playmate of the Year party. Yeah, it would have been. Um, I met Marciano there and then he wanted me to shoot for guests. And I actually went and did like a whole uh, day with them shooting never signed anything never got paid and then they ran my my um images no, internationally really? yes and i never got paid and i went to playboy and i was like what the hell is this like they're like oh it was just a test <laughs> i'm like it's published in vogue in like italy like and and they did not want to intervene because they didn't want to step on marciano's toes because of that relationship yeah. that they had 
Interesting. Because huh? there was there was a number of girls that went from Playboy to Marciano to guest. I, um, I can think of two or three that I know Sandy did. Taylor. Uh, did you did you ever shoot with Sandy Taylor? I did. The cover of her with all the fireworks behind with sparkles okay. of yeah. the Playboy. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I did that. I, I took her to uh, the uh, Bahamas, uh -huh. and we uh, we kind of had interesting times there because um, you, you know Alexis, right? Of Alexis Vogel, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Alexis had a way of doing makeup, and it of was course. very specific. So I had Sandy in the in the water on the beach, wave hit her and took off one of her eyelashes. Uh -oh. And so I, 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 I talked to, I, I, I tell uh, Alexis, you got to put it back on. I can't, I don't have the glue. Da, 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 da. I, I say, well, I got to shoot. I can't just give this up because we're, yeah. you know, we only have so many days. So I, I then went, walked up to Sandy and took the other eyelash and ripped it off. Well, get rid of that one. <laughs> get rid of that one. And, <laughs> And Alexis left the set. She was gone. She was not happy. <laughs> she was not happy because I had, you know, you know, ruined her makeup. You know, I didn't ruin it. The wave did. So, but yeah, I, you know, I no, do you were. What, yeah, I do what you to do had what to, I do. to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I can totally see Alexis like responding like that because, and my yeah. God, the best makeup artist in the world. It's like if you ever try to emulate her makeup, it's like you can never even come close. So I bet she was like, "My art, don't touch my art." <laughs> <laughs> I can totally she did, imagine. Did did she did she do yours or who did your makeup? Yeah, yeah. I always worked with Alexis. She was my favorite. Yeah, she she couldn't make. I mean, she just made you look great, you know. Yeah, it was always you didn't there. want to take their so. makeup off when you went home. I always remember going to the mansion, no. and I was like, I'm like <laughs> you had to use this. This is bomb. <laughs> so yeah, I'd always figure definitely. out something <laughs> to do. Yeah. Well, okay, so let's get into Pamela Anderson. You spent 19 years photographing Pam, and you said that she was so pleasant and fun to work with. She was. Uh, she was very genuine. Uh, she was always, uh, she had a good work ethic. Um, well, she almost always had a good work <laughs> ethic. <laughs> one, one time in France, we were there to shoot and she had to go to uh, uh, Monaco or uh, oh, uh, Monte Carlo. Monte, oh, yeah, Monte Carlo. Lunch. And they had a uh, big fashion show and there was a top male model, Sch uh, Schenkenberg. They were and dating so, Marcus Schenkenberg, yeah. Yeah, so she didn't come back for the shooting. She went to there to do an introduction, a short thing, but she stayed and they had their affair. And we had a, a I think a 10 day stay there. And then mm -hmm. Playboy didn't want to change our return. So we had, 10 days in France, in, in uh, Saint Tropez. <laughs> it was a paid vacation. Mm -hmm, so, and then exactly. She came, then, she came, then she came back and I worked with her in Santa Barbara. But yeah, for the most part, she was always on. You know, she always knew how to work the camera. She always knew what to give you. She always knew um, her how she looked the best. And Just she was a joy to work with. Yeah, mm -hmm. she was a joy to work with. You know, and then she, you know, she learned real quick. You know, she did a couple things for, for Playboy. Um, and then uh, she got the TV show. She got um, uh, Tool Watch. Time. Became a, tool, oh, became yeah. Became a Tool Time one. girl. Yeah. She right. first did that. Then she right. got on Baywatch. Okay. And when she got on Baywatch, she was portrayed as a California surf girl, beach girl. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we took her to San Tropez because Marilyn thought she should look like um, um, Bridget yes. Bardot. Bridget Bardot. Bridget Bardot. Yeah. So we were going to San Tropez. Now, I went with Alexis. Okay. And the idea was to make her a diva, to make her get rid of the um, 
beach girl look and okay. make her into the style you saw that she carried on up right. to uh, the last time I photographed her. You know, she's changed the style a lot now. But Alexis always did her makeup for the always. whole time. And, you know, and she became, with you know, the bigger hair, the heavy makeup. Um, the, she, looked, she looked like a movie star now. So, yeah, completely. Um, and that was... You know that was so i changed you know lighting on her i changed how she, sh she shot um alexis d changed her her makeup so, you know um, that that's that's actually like a good um segue because you had mentioned this before of like the difference between how arnie freytag and ken marcus um you know would shoot and it was po they wanted girls pose and you had a very different approach to taking photographs for playboy that was unlike anything that the photographers had done um you know and the one thing that you had said, you didn't see how posing and sexuality went together. <clears throat> posing did not make any sense. And you threw that out the window and got a lot more sexuality <laughs> out of the images, which when you look at them, you can see it's a vast difference from what the other photographers were shooting, in my opinion. It, it was. You can think, you can realize why Chicago was always unhappy with me. Sure. Because sure. I was changing lighting. I was changing what was used. I was changing sets, you know, when they started the set on Ken Marcus that I watched had probably seven or eight lights. Well, when I was doing centerfolds, I had 42 lights. I had a light Dang. everywhere. Wow. And so, yeah. So I wanted the lighting to look real, not uh -huh. like it was an artificial light. So it was very right. important to me that it was like how your eye sees things, not how... Right. The camera would say things and right like i said like you, you just mentioned I, I looked at this and i said this doesn't make sense sex has movements it has spontaneity it has um, feelings to it it had movement and when they and marilyn and the other photographers they fought over who is the best poser marilyn mm. or the photographer Arnie used to fight with her, used to hate her coming on set, set because she really? would change his poses. Yeah. And they they didn't get along very well. But uh, so when I came on, <laughs> she she let me run. You know, she gave me the opportunity to innovate and, you know, try different things, uh, sometimes fail, sometimes succeed. She always yeah. protected me, you know. Right. Because I got right. in trouble. I got in trouble with Hef. A lot um, because it wasn't you know it wasn't what he was used to um, but he loved it that's why he wrote what he, he wrote to me because I was the only one that did it most photographers in the fashion world would either have movement or no movement and I mm -hmm. did both I moved I sat up I, I still you know just let's see what happens and you know if you look at especially the pictures that don't get published they're, mm -hmm. they're not explicit, but they're very sexy. They just mm -hmm. have a sexual feel to them. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's more or less what I became, why I kept my job. Because there was always somebody out the door, a line of people out the door willing to take my job. And oh, of so, course. Yeah. Yeah. So I was in trouble a lot. Okay. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, what Hef talks about from an inauspicious start. That was an inauspicious start. That and he wrote that in the tribute. You know, that right. it went from that where I was essentially fired. Right, so, right. Yeah. I mean, didn't didn't he even tell you at one point? You know, I am the publisher, and what I want gets published. <laughs> like, did it come to that point? Because <laughs> yes. you just shoot. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was that was over. Uh, I, I there was a celebrity that was on the. Uh, apprentice and i uh -huh. photographed her and i was always conscious of doing what the girls the women were going to feel comfortable with uh they, you know and so there was this one situation she was in a limousine her legs were open she had underwear on uh and she was you know very enticing in the limousine sure but, but when you looked at the film and she, she says, you know, I, I don't want, you know, have a you know, 
an explicitness to it. I said, oh, it's not going to happen. You got underwear on, it's fine. Yeah. So when the film came back, the light went through the underwear and there was full explicitness. Okay. And that, that shot got into the magazine, into the layout. Now, Hef doesn't see anything but the film. He sees the film and the film has that little bit. It, it wasn't really explicit, but it was something I knew she wasn't going to be happy with. Mm -hmm. So I had Ben, who was my assistant, and this was on the digital days, and I told him to make those panties uh, opaque. So really? Hef got the, yes. So when Hef got the edition, he looked at that, looked at what the other one was, and called me up and said, you know, you got to understand, I'm, I'm the publisher of this. You know, I'm not expecting to have things changed between the pictures and the publishing. You know, and yes, sir. Okay. So that's wild. You know, I mean, that's like, yeah. that's, that's bold. That's ballsy. I got to say that to you. <laughs> <laughs> I was pretty ballsy. I was, I and, know, I, I, I could be very difficult. Okay. Yeah. Because I want to do things my way. Um, I wanted the equipment that I wanted. I mean, at that's, you know, there was a stage there where, you know, they bought Arnie and I 32 strobe packs and heads, and each pack was about $10,000. Holy so, moly. And then, and then I went and I, I wanted this light that was $10,000. And got they got, it. and you got it. Yeah. Well, you know, that, that's, that's something that, um, that we have found out from conducting these interviews is that there was no expense spared whatsoever. What it, whatever it took to get the shot, you were going to do it, whether it was on location or reshooting a centerfold wardrobe, whatever, you getting lighting. And it's always so interesting to hear that. And then also Hef's keen eye, like he, he even knew the photographers that were taking the pictures of him all the time within the <laughs> mansion, right? Documenting. Uh -huh. If there was one slide that was gone and it was like one of him looking down at a dog or something. And um, I forget who, Larry Logan told us this story. And um, Larry had taken the slide out because his eyes were closed or something. And Hef was like, don't you ever take a slide out. You leave all the film there. Like he knew exactly. So when he saw that what you had done, it was like, ah! <laughs> but, but the attention to detail and then that no cost was ever spared whatsoever and achieving what the goal was. And that was to get the perfect shot. And you can't find a company that you would work with in today's day and age that would remotely spend close to what they did to achieve well, those results. Uh, yes. I'll tell you a little quick little story and then I'll make a comment on that. I would, a lot of times studio would send me places and without asking me. And my mm -hmm. crews knew that when we got there, don't unpack because he's going to change. We're going to go somewhere <laughs> else. Right. So, I was sent. I was sent to St. Uh, Martin's, and we got a nice villa. It's up on the hill. The beach is crowded. It's a little tiny beach. It's full of, um, of tourists. So mm -hmm. I said, oh, "Look, I need. I need to get to the Bahamas. I know a place I can go there. I need a plane." So send a Learjet. Yep. 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 <laughs> <laughs> that's that's you know. So. Uh, you know, as far as no expense, because people will look at my photographs now and they say, oh, I want to look like I, you know, like in Playboy. Yeah. And, you know, I, you know, I just, can you make me do the, you know, can you make me look like that? You know, got $250,000. I can do that, you know. Right, it's, you know, right. But it's, nobody realizes how complex. I mean, my shootings were very, very complex. Like they would build a set in the studio and i'd have you know like i say 42 lights plus some main lights and guys in the back that would be moving the lights so the mm -hmm. girls could move so um yeah, yeah you know that that that's always something i like to talk about with the photographers because nobody understands how complex it was and what it took just to get <clears throat> your centerfold i mean that was a grueling experience for us personally i mean five to seven days and a you know, in a pose that you cannot move out of. It was, it was brutal. Um, but there was so much that went into it, every, you know, finite detail. And it's like, nobody would know that unless you were on set or a part of 
putting that all together. You know, you just get the picture. Yeah. That's what people see, but there's so much that went into it. Well, in the Polaroids I sent you, there is an eight by 10 progression of mm -hmm. how it starts. Mm -hmm. uh, for, you know, and that was uh, like on Susie Scott, she's on the, it's, it, she's in Utah. She's on a porch. It's so cold. She's in a, a jacket and I'm trying to set up the, the lighting, you know, because we had to uh, get something because that's what we were committed to. But in mm -hmm. the studio, the lighting is more controlled and you can, you keep adding, keep adding, you make changes. So if you look at those Polaroids, the, 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 uh, the pose is one thing in the beginning, it's a different thing in the end. Mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm. and I would get in trouble because I couldn't come back to what I did the day before. I, I didn't know that concept. And so with the girl, it, she would have, you know, she would have some idea of what she was doing. And so we'd start there and each day became better. So yeah. Marilyn then, then did, did not insist that I hold that pose. And some of the poses were so that the other guys did. Uh, I mean, they'd, they'd faint on set. Uh, both yeah. Arnie and Ken, yeah. Ken had ladies that fainted. And I, I said, I said, like, I can't get a sexual expression. You know what <laughs> Ken, Marcus, Ken Marcus said to me? He says, you know, I make them do these, uh, these poses and they can, they can't, when I'm finished with them, they can't get up because they can't walk. Yeah. And they hate, they hate me. They hate me. And he says, and I do that because the look of hate and love are the same and they're not uh -huh. going to love me. <laughs> That's interesting. And that, yeah. that makes me think about my centerfold because I, ugh, it was so hard for me. And I also, I don't know, I was 18. I don't know what the hell I was doing. I was just going into this whole new world. But um, every Polaroid that they would print out, I would look miserable. I was crying. I looked pissed. So they kept drawing the devil horns on all my Polaroids. <laughs> and I remember Marilyn coming in probably towards the end of my shoot and was like, just give her a shot of tequila or something. And then somehow we were able to capture it. But I can tell when I look in my photo that I was in total pain and I was pissed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> no, i made i i made sure my girls were happy you know right and that's the, that's the difference that's really interesting yeah, yeah. yeah. do so. you have uh do you have any like stand out um centerfolds that are your favorite that you shot or you worked with that come to mind well not on the centerfolds you know pam pam was great um yeah um uh, i did a shooting with um Edmondson, uh, what's her name? Oh, Donna. Uh, no, um, did her shooting, but no, mm -hmm. this was, um, we shot her in a, in a set that looked like we were in Paris and she oh, was, cool. she was, she was fabulous and the lighting was fabulous and she just gave a lot of sexuality to it. I mean, for the most part, everybody gave great sexuality. I, I mean, I can only think of one or two that I really struggled with. You know, mm -hmm. but other than that, because I I would sit and I would talk to them beforehand, ask mm -hmm. what their expectations were. These are my expectations. This is what's going to be going on. You're going to go into makeup. You're going to come out. We're going to do this. So everybody went in knowing what the process was going to be. Mm -hmm. And there was never any, well, I'm going to pose you and set you up. We're going to find something together that you feel comfortable with gives me and you know if you look at um, my stuff the other guys had to have this curve in the waist and the hips out you know and the boobs in a certain direction and they Marilyn you know felt she was the you know the queen of posing and the guys mm -hmm. thought they were the best at it mm -hmm. but you know she let me run with not posing people so every t every day on a centerfold was a little different than the day before right and 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 you also said that that it was really important to you that when shooting the models that you were shooting for them so they would be thrilled when they would see their images published versus what arnie and the other photographers would do is they were you know they were shooting for half and for playboy and you had a yeah, lot more I, I, 
I, I didn't go to art school. I didn't go to photography school. I didn't know how to work the equipment when I first got there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so my, my approach was just different uh, because the other guys, uh, you know, I don't want to, you know, I guess I'm bad mouthing everybody or I'm saying something. They were the photographer. And yeah, some of them said, these are not your pictures. These are my pictures. Okay. Right. right. And, and if somebody probably told you along the way that those were, you know, those were yeah. his pictures and he mm -hmm. wants to do them this way and you need to go along with it. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, my deal was these, these are not my pictures. Those are the woman's pictures. She needs to be happy with them. She needs to uh, be to come away saying this is the best experience I've ever had. I'm just so right. happy that I that I did this. So and that brought yeah. a lot more attitude because I was always looking for attitude. It had to have attitude to it. it yeah. Couldn't because in in posing, I, I never. I don't see how anybody got attitude. It had to be created. Um, I don't know, you know, your your experience, you shot with Arnie, probably. Arnie, mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> it, it was, was what it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was different. It was different. But, you know, my God, at the end of the day, my, my photographs were absolutely gorgeous. And I was told I am um, top three most published playmates of all time. And I thought that was amazing. I know that I'm in all the Playboy books. I did 10 covers. You shot the, the Seinfeld cover with... um the group of us in the, in the phone booth. Yes, in the that phone was, booth. Yeah, 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 that was a super fun So you had, you had 10, 10 U.S. or, or 10 total um, So two, two U.S. Um, and then seven of the newsstand specials, and then two, um, one German and one, I want to say Norway, which just came out like, or the Netherlands, which just came out, I don't know, maybe six years ago, a fan sent it to me. And it was from a photo shoot that David and I had done for the um, newsstand specials in Austin for Wet n Wild. Just picture me coming out of a pool and they put that on the cover and I was like, cool, here's my 10th cover. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> that was always funny because, you know, some, you know, I actually shot all my um, covers. That was just the one time that they reused a, another image, but they would do that quite often as they would go into the archives and pull images and run it as a cover. And you have, would have no idea. And it'd come out, you'd be like, oh, I'm on a cover. Who knew? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I was not a fan. I mean, Jeff, I was not a fan. Jeff, why would you say this? But, you know, Jeff didn't care for me. You know, yeah. He was very I can tell. He's, he's yeah. very. He's very gracious, gracious at the end, but at that time, you know, I was Marilyn's boy. Yeah. And so, yeah, uh, I was, I was Marilyn's boy to such an extent that when they did, when mm -hmm. they did the girls next door, Marilyn didn't think it was going to go anywhere. And so really? there was a request that I do the shooting. Marilyn said, no, I got things for him to do. I'm not going to let him do it. And it's not going to go anywhere. So she gave it to Arnie, and Arnie got tons of pictures, lots of publicity, you know, and did a, did a great job with it. Hmm. But Marilyn was so possessive, she wasn't going to get, have me do something that wasn't going to work in her mind. Right, right, and right. She was, and she was wrong because it became a big hit. I love that. I love that. I, the history with you in Maryland, I didn't realize it was, you know, that extensive and that profound. And you accredit Maryland with your success as a photographer, you know, and then goes into the project you're working on, which we'll get into in a minute. It's a little nugget of history that we pulled out from you. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me about uh, the photo shoot that you did with Pam and uh, Tommy Lee. Right? <laughs> that was a picture for a swimsuit company. And oh, okay. so Pam... Pam and the crew, we went, we went down to Cancun. Mm -hmm. Now, Pam had just met Tommy at um, one of the, the, I think it was the bar she she was a partner in. Wait, so and, you, wait, you guys, the reason why she was down in Cancun was because you guys were shooting for the swimsuit company. The and then Tommy said, company. I'm coming down. Oh, cool. Okay. 
Yeah. Tasha Cash and Pam said, no, don't come down. So yeah. he did. He came down. He's in the bar. He calls. Um, she says, no, I, you know, I'm, I can't because I'm, I'm working. And he's very persistent. Okay. And she's a little stressed out from the persistence. I don't know who Tommy Lee is. I don't <laughs> listen to gla glam rock. You know, I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a country fan. You know, and on my oh, sets, it was pro it was probably um, uh, disco because that got everybody up, and it was a dance situation. Yeah. It wasn't a glam rock, so I didn't know who <laughs> he was. I was going to talk to management about having him thrown out or having him deported. Oh my gosh, said, how funny! And she says, "No, no, no, let it be." And so she then goes out with him, and. Uh, Alexis goes and Jennifer goes and he had two of his friends there and so right. they'd party all night long um, there was a lot of uh, Don Don <laughs> yeah. yeah so uh, and uh, Pam had told Tommy he wasn't going to have she was, she was not going to have sex with him you know he was a wild man and he right. wasn't and, she, and he was intent on well to not, I don't think it was just to have uh, have sex with her, but it was to, to be have with her. a connection to be with yeah. her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they had that one night together, and I came in in the morning, and he was just leaving, and his clothes, some of his clothes, underwear there, some of the clothes were still there, mm -hmm. and she'd been up all night having sex, drinking. And I, I, you know, I got a camera and I just started taking pictures. I took mm -hmm. the pictures after pictures and she was, um, you know, she was very animated. And so I took the pictures back to when I got them, got them processed, I took them over to Playboy. I said, would you like to publish these? And I said, no, what I'd like to do is put them in the safe and you can have them when you leave. <laughs> Really? So they, were in the, they were in the safe for 18 years. Interesting. Half did not feel that she portrayed the image. She was the D to him, she was the DNA of Playboy. And she was oh, looking. Oh, and that just went she, against the grain completely. Yeah. It, oh. it changed, changed her image because she looked sure. a little drunk, a little tired, a little yeah. just having sex. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so <laughs> it was they, a, they, a they whirlwind. Went, <laughs> they went into the uh, the safe, and I didn't get them until I retired in 2013. That's wild. I love that story. I love that he gave them back to you. But I could, yeah. I, okay, that makes sense now that he is like, no, this is not going to go in line with with what we portray of Pamela. Interesting. So there's a Let backstory on everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a backstory and everything. So I recently was talking to um, Sia or Shane Barbie. I was trying to get her to come on the interview, the interview with Greg Gorman, who was the photographer that discovered me, right? And that's how my career started with Playboy. Um, and he had worked a lot with them. But Shane shared some funny stories um, with me of shooting with you. And, you know, her and her sister were out of their fucking minds because they were so sick <laughs> from their eating disorder. And they were total divas. And she says that. She's like, she's like, when we finally got well, like we made our amends and we called Hef and we called Greg Gorman and whoever else and just apologized profusely because they were just a nightmare to work with. But apparently, so she was telling me that they had gone down there and it was one of their worse like um engine sessions and so they kept pushing back the shoot is that right and then they were trying to get out of there and you told them oh we have a private jet coming just in order to capture the pictures you needed to on the beach <laughs> do you remember yeah, that well she she was difficult but very gracious at the same time and you know mm -hmm. she always loved the pictures that we got and so I shot yeah. her on the beach with her sister. Um, and again, the, the, you just let them go, okay? Because they will work. I mean, the picture that I have uh, uh, in the portfolio is that um, Shane is having her butt, her hand on the butt of Thea. And they will, the connection that was going on between them. Again, you can't, you can't pose that. 
you can't all you can do right. is be spontaneous and take the picture when it happens absolutely especially in photography i mean that's when you get the best pictures in my opinion yeah. at least i do <laughs> so what, what about what, um, what about what tell us about uh jenna jameson and tito ortiz and what happened there because that's a good story <laughs> yes uh we had gone down again to mexico we were on an eco resort okay now this eco resort had one time uh, wine, mm -hmm. too much drugs, and too many candles, and they burnt half the place down. So we went back to this place and they had rebuilt it. And it was very remote. It, one, one dirt road came into it, it went over a couple of streams, and it's very, very remote. And it's all kind of wood or bamboo. It's not concrete, it's not fire resistance or, or wind resistance. So a hurricane comes up the coast from the south. It's a category mm -hmm. four. It stops right off the coast from the resort and spins there for, spins oh my for a day. God. And so if it had come on shore, we couldn't get out. The roads were, uh, they were flooded from the rains. So there was no way out. We mm -hmm. were stuck there. So everybody thought mm -hmm. they were going to die. And so they drank a lot. Uh, you know, they, they had no phones, no cell service, mm -hmm. no way to talk mm -hmm. to anybody to, to call your loved one before you go into a whirlwind of a hurricane. But anyway, so it... it <clears throat> right. <laughs> it, 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 it's, uh, you know, everybody was scared. They were really scared. And so they you know, it wasn't that far offshore and it just had to come in or the outside of it, you know, where the winds would have got us. But then it went up the coast and got to lower part of Mexico and then went across Mexico and went into, I think, either Arizona or New Mexico. So it was a big storm mm. that lasted for a long time. But uh, when we shot, you know, we started to shoot the next day. We tried to shoot at the beach. The water's brown because so oh, much yeah. mud has, has gone into the, the water and things sure. are a little muddy and a little, but the sun came out and got beautiful pictures. What uh, photo shoot were you on where the D8? Oh, that? Yeah, that was okay. okay. We were in Mexico. Mm -hmm. There were five models from Germany. I had an assistant. Uh, second assistant, uh, makeup, hair, stylist. Okay. So the place was a place called Correas. At that time, uh, they had five, uh, an old hotel uh, that uh, the owner had bought along with four bungalows. Okay. Mm -hmm. And now it's one of the most expensive places in the world to go and buy a house and, and you know, it, it's, it's hugely successful. But at the time, it was just a little place. So to get mm -hmm. privacy, I went and asked, you know, mm -hmm. where can I go? Where's a beach? And so they send me. We go down. We go in our bus. Five, girl, five, five naked girls. Uh, the bus is stuck in the sand. So one of the assistants says, i got to go find somebody to get us out. So he goes. Right. And he finds he finds a farmer. The farmer comes comes driving up in his tractor, big tractor. turns it turns it around, hooks up a chain, pulls us out. And he's looking. He doesn't speak English, okay? He just speaks Spanish. And he's looking at this. You know, this what's five naked girls and this crew doing out right. on the beach? After a sh we go back to shooting, then all of a sudden the federales show up, and they are you know in their yeah, half trucks, you know, he likes the trucks with the machine guns on top, all carrying the mm -hmm. automatic weapons. They don't speak mm -hmm. English, we don't speak Spanish, mm -hmm. and we can't explain <laughs> what's going on. So we had to go in to uh, the jail, and they then called the DEA in Guadalajara. And Guadalajara was the uh, center of the drug 
uh, Mexican drug industry at that time. And so okay. the, the place we were we, we were in was the state of Jalisco. Now, we right. go to Jalisco now because we used to go to Puerto Vallarta and just drive down for three hours to get to uh, this hotel because it was so remote. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you did that, mm -hmm. uh, you'd probably be either killed, captured, uh, held for ransom or put into yeah. sex uh, trafficking. We would just go right. back and forth in the car. We'd get a Jeep with no top on it and be cruising down for three hours through the Mexican countryside, carefree. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they, they don't speak Spanish. They didn't speak English. We had to, they had to find out what we were doing. Were they finally, like, realized the DEA was like, oh, no, this is Playboy and, like, let him go? <laughs> Well, you could talk to somebody in English now, okay? We could explain what was going on. No, oh, right, right, we right. There. So you were able to explain. For like, okay, let's talk <clears throat> about this project that you're working on. Uh, it's an episodic TV series called Shooting Sex. And why don't you tell us what it's about? And it's brilliant. And I'm so excited that you are doing this surrounding you and Marilyn Grabowski. Well, it's a fictionalized account of Playboy mm -hmm. from 1983 to 1999, okay? Because that okay. was the kind of the heyday that I, I felt was uh, digital didn't start till 1997. So um, mm -hmm. there are a lot of stories and being fictionalized, I can pull things in that maybe happened before or I wasn't necessarily that much of a part of and they have a front end story back end story and then you know the, the shooting and it deals with Mar Marilyn and I, I I've tried to make it female friendly I've tried to make it uh, aspirational and inspirational because both Marilyn and I were dead as you know we were told we weren't going anywhere and mm -hmm. we, we came to the top of the pyramid and then with all the women that came through some went back to what they were doing. Some became stars, some got married. There's, there's always a story, you know, um, rainy day. Jordan was a great story because she had never been out of Texas mm -hmm. and she came and she was so great in her posing and everything. And then she got hooked up with the, you know, with the, the mansion. Um, and she went to a couple of parties and, you know, she was faced with a big change in her lifestyle because she had a husband and uh, a child back, uh, back in the West Texas. Mm -hmm. And so she came and she had the opportunity and she went back on her second trip and her, her daughter, her, she had a little daughter and her daughter had seen her the, on the first trip on the second trip. She was all kind of made up and dressed up. And she says, Mama, I look just like you. And that was, that was enough to go, no, you know, yeah. it's, it's not all that it's made out to be. There's yeah. too many temptations, too many things. You know, some of the, the women never go to the mansion. Some do, but everybody, you know, they're, they have their aspirations. That's why they're there. Want something to come of this. So right. it's an aspirational and inspirational story um, of not so much, Marilyn and I are the storytellers. Okay. And it's about all the people, you know, the covers that I shot, mm -hmm. uh, pictorials, the uh, centerfolds, the, it's about the models. It's behind the scenes. Nice. It's about Alexis. It's about uh, my assistants. Okay. You know, I, I had the opportunity, J Judith Regan offered to do a book on me. And it okay. was, uh, um, she did the Jenna Jameson, uh, how to have sex like a porn mm -hmm. star. Mm -hmm. Okay. She did the, uh, she did a couple others, uh, the Howard Stern, I think. But she insisted that it be a true story mm -hmm. and I'm not going to do it because I don't want to be telling all the secrets of my staff, my crews right. and everything right. that went on. 
So to protect my crews, I passed on it. And mm -hmm. it probably was a, it, you know, it wasn't maybe the best decision, but you know, I had to be true to, because we were like family. My crews were like family and they said yeah. that because mm -hmm. I took care of them. Um, I didn't treat them like assistants. I, when I was shooting, I told them to sit on my shoulder, tell me what they see, what they think, what they suggest. I might use it. I might not use it. I might use it later. But Interesting. You're part of the you're part of the shooting, mm -hmm. and you have another set of eyes. So mm -hmm. everybody on the set was to give me input if they had it. I so love I that. I couldn't be I couldn't betray them. Right. They all right. had their own. They all had their own stories. I mean, of I course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, everybody had their own vantage point and your own personal experience, and they're all going to vary from person to person. Yeah. You know, even if you're working together. So fictionalized. I, I would do uh, the people that I photographed, like the celebrities, and had a great story on uh, Belushi. But mm -hmm. so I can use Belushi's name. I can use yeah. De Niro's name. And yeah. I don't want to use, you know, Alexis's name. I'll make her. I, she has a um, made up name. Marilyn okay. has a made up name. I have okay. a made up name. But my lifestyle, how I did this, how I was in Utah, how I lived on ranches in Utah and California, how I had horses all the time. Right. Um, how I didn't know what I was doing, how how things progressed. That's all in there. And then the stories behind that we're talking about, like Jenna Jameson or the, mm -hmm. the girls of Mexico. So everybody had a story. Awesome. Well, I, I, I really believe that's going to be very well received and um, being spearheaded by an Academy Award winning producer. It's not about the mansion. It's right. It's not about Hef. Okay. Which is good it's because about... there's too much out there that's all focused on the on the mansion and on Hef. Yeah, there's a number of women that are you know, jumping on the bandwagon, if you say yeah. something nasty, you mm -hmm. can make money from it. I mm -hmm. mean, Crystal was a big disappointment to me because yep. I was friends with her. I shot all yeah. of her pictures. She yeah. didn't need to do that. She I mean, she got mm -mm. $10 million when, I know. when he died. I know. She left out, she left out a lot of things that paint a different picture. Oh, completely. So, I, I listened to her whole book and I was like, what? Hell, she's saying like this is not this is... well. Her mom lived at the mansion. Okay? I know. Mom, I know. And she said she had nobody there. there. I know. <laughs> she had nobody there, and she yeah. was so traumatically yeah. affected by it. And Holly Madison is well, Holly Madison. She she got the opportunity to be a um, an editor. Have right. Gave her that was, a job yeah, to be an editor. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, uh, she didn't have the talent to be an editor. So that it's is, unfortunate it's, that these these women have decided to trash Hef and the mansion. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that went on. There's mm -hmm. no question about that. There's mm -hmm. a lot of people, uh, you know, and, and Hef's sex life was um, was his business. But I'll tell his you personal, something. Yeah, a, exactly. I'll tell you, there's a documentary, okay? I don't think many people know about it on Hef, and there were two people assigned to it, this woman and this man from different sources, and they were given it, they both had the opera, they were both said, you're gonna do this, and they both didn't want to. And uh, the woman talked to her husband and said, um, I can't do this, I don't wanna be around Hef Hugh Hefner. He really? said, well, you're, you're, you're just starting out. You need to do this because they're going to give it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. the, the man, he went to his pastor. He got the exact same answer. Somebody else is going to do this. You need you to need do to this do interview. Mm -hmm. So they approached it from, it's a, it's a nice interview because they, it's a documentary. Um, so they approached it from not half what he did, but why he did it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they went back into his childhood. They talked mm -hmm. about his relationship with his mom. They talked about this uh, stuffed animal that got her mom, his mom burned. They, mm -hmm. You know, a dog they got from a pound that died right away. The tr he, he felt unloved, okay? Mm -hmm. And in growing up, 
he carried that with him. And that's one of the things he and I, we, we didn't, you know, I didn't know about his um, childhood and he never knew about mine. So we pretty mm -hmm. much had a very similar childhood. I felt I was unloved. I was always looking for love. Before I was a playboy in my 20s, I was married three times. Okay. Oh. Three times, dang! Wow. Yeah. Okay. In my twenty, in my twenties, in your twenties, I chose were interesting, but <laughs> you didn't. I, I, at the end of the documentary, when it was finished, they said that they were so positive about Hef. They said he did all these things, you know, with the magazine, with clubs, everything was that so he would be loved. Because mm -hmm. then he never really found the love, and then he's the final portrayal is crystal. The worst, the worst. You know, it, I mean, it's it's after having many conversations, especially with his closest friends, and asking them, you know, what was that like for you to watch what was going on from the time that like the girls next door came in to you know crystal. I mean, that's when Playboy went downhill. When it was sold, it was over. Like Playboy, as we know, it was over. The, the caliber of the girls and then, yeah, Holly stepping in as an editor. Give me a fucking break. That woman had no idea what she was doing. Um, but it's very apparent to to me now, and, and I would say Karina and a couple other of us, that from talking to his closest confidants that were there through it all, you know, they all said, you know, he made horrible decisions at the end of his life, but he, he, he was getting older. We all will get older. Our mind will go, you know, and when the vision goes, the vision goes. Right. And, you know, he, he really felt that these women loved him. I mean, he really did. And he had no idea that Crystal would come and do what the hell she did. Like he would have never, he would have never gone into well, that or he would have never made her the president of the foundation, whatever. And it's just so sad because he was completely taken advantage of. And Kimberly Hefner, I had a conversation with her, direct quote from her. She said, the only thing I will say is that what happened is 1000% elder abuse. And I was like, I can't agree with you more. Yeah, I, I don't think uh, Crystal, well, there, there's mixed things. You, you know, she left him on the altar at one right. point. Right. You know yeah. why? How that happened? And why she mm -hmm. came back? That's not oh. in the book, I'm sure. Oh, it is in the book, but her version is makes no fucking sense. So no, tell me why, because it's not clear. <laughs> well, she did a, a a music demo with a guy named uh, Blakey. Mm -hmm. Okay, big music producer. And she sounded great. And she listened to this and she thought she was going to be a new rock star. And okay. so she could see that as a vehicle to leave Hef because she's going to have her own money. She's going to have her own fame. And she took up an affair with uh, uh, Dr. Phil's son. Okay. Right. So she was having yeah. an affair with Dr. Phil's son. Right. Now, she talks about then, that. And then what happened is that in leaving Hef, Hef said, well, I'm going to pay for your music career. And when she met with Blakey, he said, you know, you can't sing. This was <laughs> done on the computer. Right. So she now had nowhere to go. So she went back to Hef. And I, I do think that she had really strong affections for him because I watched her and them interact a lot. And, you know, I, I, like I said, I shot all of her pictures. Um, so I, I think it was just somebody talked her into, if you're going to write a book and you're going to you make all this money, you got to yeah. trash the situation. Yeah, and strike while the iron's hot because Holly Madison is out there producing, you know, the Playboy Murder Show, affiliating all these tragic incidents that had happened to women that were either in Playboy or Playmates that had nothing to do with them. Like Playboy did not murder them, right? So she's got that show plus her <laughs> book. And so, of course, like, you know, Crystal jumped on the bandwagon and it's just it's. Like you can see straight through it. We can see straight through it. But general public believes everything that these girls are saying. And so thank God, again, that we have like this platform and we can have these real authentic conversations with people that were there 
that got to see firsthand, you know, and there's there's two versions to the story. It's not just one well, side. Kimber, of yeah. Kimberly was married to have for 21 years. He had two kids. Right. It right. wasn't, the, you know, the easiest of relationships. Right. Um, but she was there, mm -hmm. you know, and she's, you know, she's she wrote an, um, a little piece to say that everything these women are doing was right. not really the the norm because there's 700 800 playmates so how many it, have yeah. complained yeah how yeah. many have complained none none two, it's all these two, girlfriends two three yeah 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 exactly exactly yeah thank god i'm i've um i've been um grateful to be able to talk to kimberly and i've invited her on the show she's hesitant to do anything but i think at some point she will come on but again it's just her her complete and utter um, respect and love and affinity for Hef stands and will always be there. And she, you know, if anybody was going to say something about a bad experience, it would be somebody who was married him for 21 years. She's nothing to say that's negative. <laughs> These girls, it's a money grab, obviously. I don't, I, I really don't believe that what's in the Crystal's book, she really feels 100% mm -mm. on it. I feel she, she did it for you know there's a big payday at the end of it and she didn't even write the book she had a, she had a ghost writer so it's not even her it's yeah. a ghost writer yeah so yes <laughs> we're in agreement on that so anyway yeah. well cool i'm glad that you actually brought that up and other people from playboy that you know could have a different vantage point and we're able to share it and yeah and amen. you know my 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 tv show is to be very positive it's behind right. the scenes Right. And a lot of crazy things went on behind the scenes. And mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that everybody was having sex left and right, but just exactly. the personalities, you know, and the situations, you know, the my life, my, my life is crazy. Uh, yeah. Alexis' life was crazy. Um, Jennifer Tudor had a very stable life, you know, a loving husband, still married, still doing great. Um, John Crannon had a very um, tragic end to his life. Um, uh, who was there? Was another stylist that committed suicide. Mm. She was with uh, involved with an actor. Um, and yeah, he went I mean, back there's... to his wife. He went back to he went back to his wife, and she was so distraught she got in the bathtub and cut her wrist. Fortunately, so, you know, there's there are those stories, but it's not like a direct, I don't know, it's not like Playboy did it to them, you know, it's just It's, it's not that it's Playboy life. did it, no. Yeah. Playboy you know? was, a, for for 98% of the women, it was it was a positive experience. Mm -hmm. yeah, that were absolutely. photographed were, and that were playmates and were really Playboy. Like I said, yeah. the girlfriends, uh, Holly and the other two, they were never to be playmates. They could not be playmates. Never. And no, I, never. And that's and the same thing. Well, with Crystal, she was a playmate. But Yeah, so. but that's because she married. Yeah. Half was like, okay, you're gonna run away from me. You're gonna come back, then whatever, make you playmate and put you on the cover. Yeah. <laughs> no. So anyway. Do you know do you do you recall the name of that documentary that you were just telling me about about the man and woman that uh, interviewed Huff and had great things to say when they were all done? And send you the the okay. tape, yes. Cool. It would be, I think, a great guest for you because yeah. they're very positive. They're very positive about Hef. Very and positive. Their and their their hesitation initially to not want to do it, and then it to do it and come it out. It was no. We don't. It was do like this. hard no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they, it was, and if you want it, you want a career, you got to go do it. Yeah, And they were exactly. very surprised by him, and they he, by who his, he was humi humility and his caring about people, mm -hmm. all the, the charitable things that he was involved in. He doesn't get credit for that. He you know, doesn't. He and we talk about it all the time on here because, again, I didn't even know half the stuff that he was involved in. And his philanthropic endeavors are vast and many, and it does not get discussed enough. I mean, it really needs to be known forever. And there's, I'm sorry, at the end of the day, people are just going to try to, you know, decimate the history of playboy and of Hugh Hefner well it's not going to happen it's history it's 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 part of America it's American culture you know what would America yeah. be without playboy it'd be very different I think <laughs> oh, no no it, it wouldn't be a probably 
Okay. Yeah. Ha, ha, Playboy set outside of New York and Los Angeles. Playboy sent set style. Sent uh, was it arbiter of what was beauty, beautiful and what was sexual. And Marilyn Grabowski was the biggest arbiter of all on what was sexy, mm -hmm. because she made the decision on who was to get in mm -hmm. and how it would it would go. You know, and mm -hmm. uh, and you know, and her best decision was hiring me. <laughs> yeah, I concur. <laughs> That's excellent. That's a perfect way to end the show. I love that. <laughs> so, okay, before we leave, um, at the end of each interview, we ask our guests two questions. Okay. So, first question: three words that define Hugh Hefner to you. Uh, a creative genius. Perfect. Three words. <laughs> a creative genius. Okay. Um, and had you had the chance to say anything to Huff before he passed or in memoriam, what would you say? Uh, in a letter that I wrote him before he died, it was a big thank you that he gave mm -hmm. me an opportunity that I would not have had. And I'm glad that I was able to live up to his expectations. That's the general answer from everybody is just thank you. Thank you for including me on this journey. Thank you for the opportunity. So I love that. Thank you, Stephen. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Well, that was a wonderful show. Thank you so much for tuning in um, to our audience around the world. Thank you for your love and your support. Uh, please follow us at the Bunny Chronicles podcast or Bunny Chronicles podcast on Instagram. We also have our Facebook uh, page, Bunny Chronicles podcast, our YouTube channel. Please like, subscribe, and share. And if you want to support the show, you can support us at Patreon. Thank you so okay. much to the audience. We Thank appreciate you, you Stephen. Thank the you. Wonderful. Thank you.